Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 295, James Martineau on John 1. James Martineau was born in 1805 and died at the ripe old age of 95 in the year 1900. In his day, he was one of the most famous and influential English Unitarian thinkers. Throughout the long course of his life, he served as a minister, and then as a professor, and then as an administrator. Martineau was a philosopher, and I don't really know that much about his philosophical work. And I don't know to what extent he was subject to some of the unfortunate philosophical influences sweeping through Unitarianism in the 19th century. At any rate, today's podcast concerns purely his views about scriptural interpretation. What you're about to hear is one of the most helpful discussions I have ever found regarding interpreting the famous prologue to the fourth gospel. This is a small part of a book entitled Unitarianism Defended, a series of lectures by three Protestant dissenting ministers of Liverpool in reply to a course of lectures entitled Unitarianism Confuted by 13 Clergymen of the Church of England. In this book, three Unitarian ministers undertake to rebut the case that the Bible is correctly understood Trinitarian put forth by these 13 other ministers. One of these three Unitarians was James Martineau. The fifth lecture in their series is called The Proposition That Christ is God Proved to Be False from the Jewish and the Christian Scriptures. So you could say it's an argument against the deity of Christ. In the context of the whole argument of this lecture, Martineau is arguing that there are certain things we would expect to find in Scripture if the authors were Trinitarians. And yet we don't find those things. And so this is powerful evidence that the authors were not Trinitarians. The general form of argument, then, is similar to what I gave in my lecture that was in Trinity's podcast 189, The Unfinished Business of the Reformation. One of these things that we don't see in Scripture, he describes like this, that as it is important not to confound the three persons in the Godhead, they will be kept distinct, having some discriminative and yet not interchangeable titles, and moreover, since each has precisely the same claim to be called God, that word will be assigned to them with something like an impartial distribution. And he's pointing out that this is just not what you see in the New Testament at all. So he's discussing various texts in which it is believed that Jesus is called God in the New Testament. And he comes to chapter 1 in the Gospel according to John. He writes, Let us turn to the prologue of St. John's Gospel, that most venerable and beautiful of all the delineations which Scripture gives us of the twofold relation of Christ's Spirit, to the Father who gave it its illumination, and to the brethren who were blessed by its light. To our cold understandings, indeed, this passage must inevitably be obscure, for it deals with some of the characteristic conceptions of that lofty speculative reason which, blending the refinements of Platonism with the imaginative license of the Eastern schools, assumed in early times the intellectual empire of the church, and has kept the world ever since in deliberation on its creations. I do not mean that the apostle was a Platonist or a disciple of any philosophical system, but he wrote in Asia Minor, where he was surrounded by the influences in constant familiarity with the terms and accustomed to the modes of thought peculiar to the sects of speculative religionists most prevalent in his time. At all events, it is a fact that he uses language nowhere employed by the other evangelists or apostles, and that this language is the very same which is the common stock and technical vocabulary of Philo, the Platonizing Jew, and several Christian writers of the same or a kindred school, before, however, endeavoring to suggest the idea which the apostle did mean to convey, let me call your attention to that which he did not. There cannot be a more misplaced confidence than that which the introductory verses of St. John's Gospel are appealed to by the holders of the Athanasian doctrine. In other words, Trinitarians. 
Whatever explanation is adopted which does not throw contempt upon the composition of the evangelist is at all events subversive of their system, and I do not hesitate to say that this is the only thing which I can regard as certain respecting this passage, that it never could have been written by an Athanasian. In order to test this assertion, it is necessary to look beyond the first verse, and before we read it, let us allow the Trinitarian to choose any sense he pleases of the word God, which is its leading term. Let us suppose that he accepts it as meaning the Father, and that the word or logos means God the Son. With these substitutions, the verse reads thus, In the beginning was the Son, and the Son was with the Father, and the Son was the Father. This, surely, is to confound the persons. Let us then suppose the meaning different, and the whole Godhead or Trinity to be meant by the word God. The verse would then read thus, In the beginning was the Son, and the Son was with the Trinity, and the Son was the Trinity. We are no nearer to consistency than before, and it is evident that before the Trinitarian can find in the passage any distinct enunciation, the term God must be conceived to bear two different meanings in this short verse, a verse so symmetrical in its construction as to put the reader altogether off his guard against such a charge. He must read it thus. In the beginning was the second person of the Trinity, and the second person was with the first and the second person was possessed of divine attributes as such. We might surely ask, without unreasonableness, why, when the society or personal affinity of the Son in the Godhead is mentioned in the middle clause, the companionship of the Father only is noticed, and silence observed respecting the Holy Spirit, who at that moment could not possibly have been absent from the conceptions of any Athanasian writer. But independently of this, the awkwardness of the construction, the violence of the leading transition of meaning, render the interpretation altogether untenable. If it be true, never surely was there a form of speech worse devised for the conveyance of the intended ideas. In order to give the passage its true force, there is no occasion to assign to the word God any but its usual signification, as the name of the one infinite person or being who created and rules the universe. But it is less easy to embrace and exhibit with any distinctness the notion implied by the phrase word or logos. The ancient speculative schools, seeing that the deity had existed from eternity, and therefore in a long solitude before the origin of creation, distinguished between his intrinsic nature, deep, remote, primeval, unfathomable, in Greek logos and diathetos, and that portion of his mind which put itself forth or expressed itself by works, so as to come into voluntary and intelligible relations to men. Lagos perforikos. This section of the divine mind, to which was attributable the authorship of the divine works, they called the Lagos, or the image of God, both terms denoting the expression or power which outwardly reveals internal qualities, the one taking its metaphor from the ear, through which we make known our sentiments by speech, the other from the eye, to which is addressed the natural language of feature and liniment. If I might venture on an illustration which may sound strangely to modern hearers, I should say that the Logos was conceived of in relation to God, much as with us genius is, in relation to the soul of its possessor. To denote that peculiar combination of intellectual and moral attributes which produces great, original, creative works, works which let you into the spirit and affections, as well as the understanding of the author. Anyone who can so possess himself with the speculative temper of Christian antiquity as to use with reverence the phrase, genius of God, would find it, I am persuaded, a useful English substitute, though I am well aware not a perfect equivalent for the word logos. Dwelling within the blank immensity of God was this illuminated region of divine ideas, in which, as in the imagination and the studio of an artist, the formative conceptions, the original sketches and designs, the inventive projects of beauty and good shaped and perfected themselves, and from which they issued forth, 
to imprint themselves on matter and life and pass into executed and visible realities. From the energy of this creative spirit or blessed genius of God, two very different orders of results were conceived to flow. The forms and symmetrical arrangements of the material universe by which, as by the engraving of a seal, deity stamped his perfections into vision, and the intuitions of pure reason and conscience in the human soul, by which, as by a heavenly tone or vibration, deity thrilled himself into consciousness. And when I say deity, I mean the logos of deity, for this alone it was conceived, stood in any relations to us, the rest was an unexpressed and unfathomable essence. This portion of the divine infinitude was incessantly and vividly personified, so as to assume, even in the writings of the Jew and undoubted monotheist Philo, the frequent aspect of a second god. Though scarcely have you taken up this idea from one series of passages before you are recalled and corrected by others, clearly showing that this is a false impression too hastily derived from the intensity of the imagery and language. Indeed, the distinction between a mere personification and a positive mythological personage is very faint. When a writer personifies an abstraction, for the moment he conceives of this object of thought as a person, and were this state of mind perpetuated, he would believe it to be a person. But his mental attitude changes, and in a less excited hour, that which had constructed and painted itself almost into a being fades away again into an attribute. Hence the fluctuation of writers, at once imaginative and speculative, like Philo and some of the early Christian fathers, between the logical and the mythical method of speaking of the properties of the divine nature. And it may be remarked that the Apostle John partook, though in a very slight degree, of the same tendency. He was fond of abstract words, calling our Savior the way rather than the guide, the truth rather than the teacher, the light rather than the illuminator. And so, I conceive, in the commencement of his gospel, the inspiration rather than the inspired of God. And then, as if to remedy the indistinctness of this mode of representation, he resorts to personification, thus, at the dictation of his reverence, first reducing the living person to an abstraction, and afterwards, at the bidding of his imagination, recreating the abstraction into a person. The extent to which this personification may be carried by an author who certainly had no notion but of one personal God may be estimated from a few sentences referring to this very conception of the Logos from the Jewish Philo. The invisible and intellectual Logos, he says, is the image of God by whom the world was fashioned. His firstborn son, his vice-regent in the government of the world, the mediator between God and his creatures, the healer of ills, God's divine son, whose mother is wisdom. In another place, the Logos is the very same with the wisdom of God, the most ancient angel, the firstborn of God, to the resemblance of whom everyone who would be a son of God must fashion himself. He is even the, quote, second God. Philo writes, to the archangel and most ancient Logos, God granted this distinguished office, that he should stand on the confines of creation and separate between it and its creator. With the incorruptible being, he is the suppliant for perishable mortality. He is the ambassador of the supreme to the subject creation. He announces the will of the ruler to his subjects, and he delights in the office and boasts of it, saying, I had stood between you and the Lord as mediator, being neither unbegotten as God, nor begotten as you, but between the two extremes, and acting as hostage to both. All of this sounds very mysterious. The important thing to bear in mind is that the writer is certainly speaking not of any separate divine person, but of the personified attributes of the one soul supreme. St. John, then, I conceive, does the very same, only he carefully warns us against thinking of his personification as otherwise than identical with the Supreme, by saying outright that the Logos is God, and therefore that whatever he may say about the former is really to be understood as spoken of the latter. 
The whole prologue divides itself into two ideas, that from the genius or logos of God have proceeded two sets of divine works, the material world and the soul and inspiration of heaven shed upon the world through Christ. His object, I believe, is to link together these two effects as successive and analogous results, physical in one case, spiritual in the other, of the same divine and holy energy. Having warned us, as I have said in the very first verse, that this energy is not really a person distinct from the Supreme, he abandons himself without reserve to the beautiful personification which follows, assuring us that thereby were all things made at first, and thereby were all men being enlightened now, that our very world which felt that forming hand of old had not discerned the blessed influence which again descended to regenerate it. Ungrateful treatment! as of one who came unto his own, and his own received him not. Yet were there some of the more perceptive conscience and better hearts, and they, be they Jew or Gentile, whose spirits sprung to the divine embrace, were permitted to become, by reflected similitude, the sons of God. Thus far, that is, to the end of the thirteenth verse, there is no mention of Jesus Christ as an individual. There is only the unembodied personification of the abstract energy of God in the original design and the newer regeneration of the world. Nor should there be any difficulty in this separation of the divine spirit from its positive and personal results. Of the creative mind of God, we can easily think as not only prior to the act of creation, but still apart from the forms of matter. And so can we of the illuminating or regenerative mind of God, as not only prior to its manifestation in Christ, but apart from its embodiment in his person. In the next verse, however, the heavenly personification is dropped upon the man Jesus. The mystic divine light is permitted to sink into the deeps of his humanity. It vanishes from separate sight, and there comes before us, and henceforth lives within our view throughout the gospel, the man of sorrows, the child of God, with the tears and infirmities of our mortal nature and the moral perfection of the divine. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Martineau preemptively responds to an objection that many will have to this sort of understanding of the beginning of John's Gospel. After the passage you just heard in his lecture, Martineau moves on to 1 Timothy 3.16 and then Hebrews 1 and other texts. But in a long note at the end of the lecture, he returns at length to interpreting this introduction to John's Gospel. He calls this note E on the prologue of John. He writes, The objection which is most commonly entertained to the foregoing interpretation of the prologue of St. John's Gospel arises from the strength and vividness of the personification of the Logos. A real personality, it is said, must be assumed in order to satisfy the terms of the description, which could never have been applied by the Apostle to a mere mental creation. I am by no means insensible to the force of this objection, though I think it is of less weight than the difficulties which beset every other explanation, and it appears to be greatly relieved by two considerations. First, that a considerable part of the difficulty arises from a lack of correspondence between the Greek and the English usage of language. Secondly, that this personification did not originate with the Apostle, but had become, by slow and definable gradations, an established formula of speech. The first of these considerations I will introduce to my readers in the words of Archbishop Waitley. Quote, our language possesses one remarkable advantage with a view to this kind of energy in the constitution of its genders. All nouns in English which express objects that are really neuter 
are considered as strictly of the neuter gender. The Greek and Latin, though possessing the advantage, which is lacking in the languages derived from them, of having a neuter gender, yet lose the benefit of it by fixing the masculine or feminine genders upon many nouns denoting things inanimate. Whereas in English, when we speak of any object in the masculine or feminine gender, that form of expression at once confers personality upon it. When virtue, for example, or our country are spoken of as females, or ocean as a male, etc., they are, by that very circumstance, personified. And a stimulus is thus given to the imagination from the very circumstance that, in calm discussion or description, all of these would be neuter. Whereas in Greek or Latin, as in French or Italian, no such distinction could be made. The employment of virtus, or virtus in the Latin, virtue, and arite, virtue in Greek, in the feminine gender, can contribute accordingly no animation to the style, when they could not, without a grammatical mistake, be employed otherwise. Now let anyone read the English prologue of John, and ask himself how much of the appearance of personality is due to the occurrence again and again of the pronouns he, him, his applied to the logos. Let him remember that this much is a mere imposition practiced unavoidably upon him by the idiom of our language and gives no animation to the style in the original. I am persuaded that the violence of the personification will be tamed down to the apprehension of a very moderate imagination. It is true that the Logos does not, by this allowance, become impersonal. Other parts of the personal conception remain in the acts of creation and of illumination attributed to this divine power. Hence the substitution of the neuter pronouns it and its for the masculinities he, him, his though useful, provisionally, for shaking off the English illusion to which I have referred, cannot be allowed to represent the sentiment of the passage faithfully. Let me pause and paraphrase Martineau's point there really quickly. What he's saying is that in the original language, referring to the Logos as a he doesn't really amount to a strong personification. Yet there is personification in this passage, however you understand it. So if you try to translate using the neuter terms it and its instead of he and his, you're not being faithful to the original language. Martineau continues, There appears to be another peculiarity of our language and modes of thought as contrasted with the Greek, which exaggerates in the common translation the force of the personification. The English language leaves to an author a free choice of either gender for his personifications. And the practical effect of this has been that the feminine personifications have been selected as most appropriate to abstract qualities and attributes of the mind. And although instances are not lacking of masculine representations of several of the human passions, the figure is felt in such cases to be much more vehement and more entirely beyond the limits of prose than the employment of the other gender. What imagination would naturally think of pity of fear, of joy, of genius, of hope, as male beings. It may be doubted whether our most imaginative prose writers present any example of a male personification of an attribute. I can call to mind instances in the writings of Milton and Jeremy Taylor of this figure so applied to certain material objects as the sun and the ocean, but not to abstract qualities or modes, unless when a conception is borrowed as of old time, from the ancient mythology. And accordingly, to an English reader, such a style of representation must always appear forced and strange. But a writer in a language like the Greek cannot choose the sex of his personifications. It is already decided for him by the gender already assigned to the abstraction about which he is occupied, and both he and his readers must accommodate their conceptions to this idiomatic necessity. In the German, the moon is masculine, the sun feminine, and every reader of that language knows the strange incongruities which, to English perceptions, this peculiarity introduces into its poetical imagery. For example, there is a German translation of Mrs. Barbeau's hymns in prose, a passage of which rendered literally into English would read thus, 
I will show you what is glorious. The sun is glorious. When she shineth in the clear sky, when she sitteth on the bright throne in the heavens, and looketh abroad over all the earth, she is the most excellent and glorious creature the eye can behold. The sun is glorious, but he that made the sun is more glorious than she. Again, there is the moon bending his bright horns like a silver bow and shedding his mild light like liquid silver over the blue firmament. In the Greek literature, accordingly, the masculine personification of abstractions is as easy and common as the feminine. And the former occurs in many instances in which an English author, having free choice, would prefer the latter. Thus, in Homer, fear is a son of Mars, but in the poet Collins, a nymph, and so in the poet Coleridge. The ancient poet Pindar must make envy a masculine power. Coleridge thus describes the same feeling giving itself speech. He writes, Shall slander, squatting near, spit her cold venom in a dead man's ear? And common as it is for English writers to give a feminine personification to wisdom and genius, Philo expressly says they are of the masculine gender, and the husband of the other faculties of the soul. The divine attributes are, I think, uniformly represented by the pronoun she in imaginative religious writers like Bishop Taylor, Mercy, justice, goodness thus assume in the works of that great man the same form as wisdom in the book of Proverbs. And it may be doubted whether, if the Apostle John had written in the English language and with English feelings, the personification in his prologue might not have presented itself in the same shape. Anyone who will read over the passage with this idea will find, I think, that the figure thus modified appears by no means inconceivable. Have we not, in the peculiarity of our language to which I have alluded, one reason why English theologians appear to have felt more difficulty than foreign theologians in seizing the true idea of the Logos, and why the disposition to consider it as an objective and absolute person has been much more prevalent among all parties here than on the continent? When the Trinity's podcast returns... Martineau considers this personified Logos in previous Jewish literature. But a more important consideration for the understanding of this prologue is this. The Apostle is not the originator of the conception respecting the Logos, but simply adopted it in the shape toward which it had been organizing itself for centuries. Three successive states of the idea can be traced in the Old Testament. It appears in Proverbs 8 as a mere transient personification of divine wisdom. In the apocryphal books of Ecclesiasticus and Wisdom, it presents itself in a more permanent and mythical character, and in the writings of Philo, it assumes so embodied and hypostasized a form as to perplex the simplicity of his monotheism. From his writings, the whole prologue of his contemporary John, except where the Baptist and Jesus are mentioned by name, might be constructed. This coincidence in phraseology so remarkable cannot be considered as accidental. Is it thought impossible that John should say of an attribute of God that it was with him from the first? We reply, Philo does say so, calling goodness the most ancient of God's qualities, wisdom older than the universe, logos the assessor, parados and apados of God, prior to all creations, a needful companion of deity, as the joint originator with him of all things. And the son of Sirach says, in his personification of wisdom, I am come out of the mouth of the Most High, firstborn before all creatures. He created me from the beginning and before the world. 
Is it said that such a sentiment is unworthy of revelation? We reply, it occurs in the writings of Solomon. In Proverbs 8, wisdom says, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. Then I was by him as one brought up with him. End quote. Where the feminine form totally excludes the idea of wisdom being anything more than a personification. Is it thought impossible that an attribute of God should be called the only begotten Son of God? We turn to Philo and find this same Logos entitled the Most Ancient Son of God and the First Begotten. Is it inconceivable that, through this transforming energy of God, those who received it should be said to become sons of God? Philo says, If you are not yet worthy to be denominated a son of God, be earnest to put on the graces of his first begotten Logos, the most ancient angel, and, we may say, an archangel of various titles. For if we are not prepared to be esteemed children of God, we may at all events be thus related to the most holy Logos, his eternal image, for the most ancient Logos is the image of God. As all theological considerations suggested by heretics are apt to be dismissed with mere expressions of surprise and contempt, I am happy to refer, in confirmation of the foregoing views, in the most essential particulars, to an orthodox writer, whose accurate and various learning and sound and grave judgment have given him a merited preeminence among the commenters on the Gospel of John. I allude to Professor Luke, whose Commentar über das Evangelium des Johannes I have had the opportunity since the delivery of this lecture of consulting. I wish that I could lay before my readers the whole of his admirable history of the rise and progress of the idea of the Logos, but I must content myself with translating a few brief extracts. The origin and germ of the theological formula of the Logos are furnished in the canonical Hebrew books, alluding to certain passages, especially Proverbs 8, which he has been showing to be mere poetical personifications of the divine attributes. It obtained its full development in the Jewish theology, in the writings of the Alexandrian Philo. And, in an intermediate state of formation, we find it in the Greek apocryphal books of the Old Testament. Luke examines the conception in all these stages, and from his analysis of Philo's mode of thought, I extract the following. According to Philo, God, in his interior essence, is inconceivable, hidden, solitary, self-comprised, and without relations to any other existence. Although the absolute cause of all that is, God cannot, in his own essence, and immediately operate on the universe, either in the way of creation, preservation, or government. Concealed in his absolute separation, God is manifest and an object of knowledge in the world only through his powers, in Greek, dunamis. These external forces of God in the universe, apart from his absolute essence, are the necessary media of his presence in the universe. These divine dunamis, Philo calls sometimes ideas, sometimes angels, sometimes logoi, this identification of notions, powers, ideas, angels, logoi, which is frequent in the writings of Philo, is of great importance for the right apprehension of his doctrine of the divine logos. This logos he considers in a twofold relation. Sometimes he regards it as inherent or imminent and refers it to him as a capacity when it is the divine nous or mind analogous to the human. But this attributive conception gives way to that of logos and diathetos as the living energetic dunamis power which tends to external action. Of this, Philo, in the spirit of Platonism, conceives as idea ideon, the ideal of things, the archetypal idea, the pattern world, the noetos cosmos, which is extant in God as a reality before all outward creatures of the actual universe. In this sense, the Logos is the primary energy of God, the enoesis, the Logosmos Theo. In this sense, the Logos is the primary energy of God. But at the same time, the Logos is also proforikos and the expressed word, and as a forming activity goes forth out of God. 
But as this is only another relation of the divine Logos, namely relation to the world, so it is the product of the former, yet essentially one with it, like the oikos, the home or dwelling place of the inherent Logos, as human speech is the resident point of the idea, its form of manifestation. All living active relations of God to the world, all his objective manifestations, are comprised in this emanated Logos. He forms the world or creates it, imprinting himself on matter as a divine seal, and as he has created the world, or otherwise God through him, Diatu, so he preserves it. He is the indwelling and sustaining power, full of life and light, and filling everything with divine light and life. So in the human world, he is both the natural divine power of every soul, the pure intellect, the conscience, and the bestower of wisdom and the watch of virtue. He is the same with the wisdom of God, the Holy Spirit of God in his objective manifestation in the world, partly because animating and inspiring men, particularly in the capacity of prophetic spirit. Luke continues, Hence the Logos is the eldest creation of God, the Eternal Father's eldest Son, God's image, mediator between God and the world, the highest angel, the second God, the high priest, the reconciler, intercessor for the world and men, whose manifestation is especially visible in the history of the Jewish people. In a footnote, Martineau writes, For the sake of brevity, I have given rather an abstract than a translation. He cites the commentary on the Gospel according to John by Friedrich Luke, Volume 1, pages 232 to 238, printed in Bonn, Germany, 1833. Martineau writes, it ought to be added that some able writers, as Grossman and Grorer, conceive that Philo invested his Logos with a real personality. The reasons for this opinion do not appear to me to be satisfactory. Even those who adopt it assign to this hypostasis a rank wholly subordinate in Philo's estimation to the Supreme God. And Luke strenuously maintains that both the Alexandrian philosopher and the Apostle John apply the name God to the Logos only in a figurative sense. He considers the clause, the word was God, merely incidental and unimportant compared with the preceding clause, the word was with God. John, he observes, sums up the purpose of the first verse in the words of the second verse. Autus ein en arche prostantheon. He was in the beginning with God. From his not taking up again the idea theos ein halagos, the word was God, we must conclude that he considered this position only an accessory. Thus, the prostantheon, the with God, is evidently to be the more prominently marked assertion. John would say the primeval logos is prostantheon, that is, is in such communion with God, stands in such relation to him that he may be called theos, God. Looking at the historical connection between the mode of expression in Philo and in John, there is no room for doubt that theos is to be taken in the sense in which Philo applies the name theos to the poetike dunamis to theou, the productive powers of God, and explicitly calls the logos God, hadouteros theos, the second God. But to prevent misunderstanding, he expressly subjoins that this is only en katakrese, that it's used improperly or not in the usual way. Though John, as we have seen, understands by the Logos a real divine person, he yet, as a Christian apostle, held the monotheistic conception of God in a still higher degree and an incomparably purer form. See John 17.3 or 1 John 5.20, then Philo. And are we then at liberty to suppose that by him, less than by Philo, the phrase theos ein halagos is meant simply en katakrese? In other words, that it's improperly said? It is true that the substitution for theos of the adjective theos, so with an extra i as the third letter, is at variance with the analogy of New Testament diction. We must not, with the Alexandrian fathers, especially Origen, conclude that theos without the article is to be taken as marking the difference between the indefinite sense of divine nature and the definite absolute conception of God expressed by ha theos, the God in Greek. Thus would John's theos correspond with Paul's icon to theou, image of God. Such an accordance between the manner of Paul and of John 
is an advantage which must appear an equally desirable result of exegesis, whether we consider it in its dogmatical or in its historical relations. Martineau comments, From this extract it appears that, if the author does not approve of the old Socinian interpretation, which considers the Logos as synonymous from the first with Jesus Christ, it is not because he knows that Theos in the predicate cannot signify a god, or slights Origen's opinion on the usage of New Testament and Hellenistic Greek, we have here an authority than which no higher can be produced from among the living or the dead in favor of a meaning which, to the fastidious scholarship of Liverpool theologians, our opponents in this debate, is absolutely intolerable. Look, of course, admits the general rule respecting the omission of the article with the predicate noun, but he conceives greatly to the horror, no doubt, of those whose soul resides in syntax, that the good old apostle would even have committed a grammatical mistake in respect of a Greek article for the sake of expressing a great truth in respect of God. He writes, If there had been any intention to express the substantial unity of the Logos and God, we should have expected the apostle to write Hotheos. On account of the equivocal meaning of theos without the article, the article could not possibly have been absent. End quote. It is vain to say that such corrupt Greek as this cannot be ascribed to the apostles. We can find examples of this in this very book, and in the writings of Paul. Nay, we even have an example in the following text of a total inversion of the rule, the article being attached to the predicate and not to the subject which is the Greek version of 1 Kings 18.21. He comments in his footnote, there would be no difficulty in increasing the number of instances exemplifying this supposed grammatical mistake. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Martineau considers another objection to his reading of John's prologue, and I offer some concluding thoughts. I think it right to add that, to the view which has been given of the prologue, an objection of some weight occurs in the twelfth verse. The clause, to them that believe on his name, presents the question, who is denoted by the pronoun his, the Logos or Jesus Christ personally? According to the interpretation which I have recommended, it should mean the former, the Logos. According to the analogy of scriptural diction, certainly the latter. Feeling the force of the difficulty, I yet think it less serious than those which attend every other hypothesis, and incline to think that the clause is an anticipation of the personal introduction of the incarnate Logos, which immediately follows, a point of transition from the personification to the history. Before we go, some parting thoughts about this discussion of the prologue to John by James Martineau. I think things got a little bit murky when he was in his long quotations from the Trinitarian German commenter on the passage where he was reproducing some ideas with which he didn't wholly agree. But just to review some of what I think are very profound points about interpreting this difficult passage, first of all, it's the Trinitarians who should be worried. This idea of multiple persons in God is not an idea that you see anywhere in John's writings. And so we can't help ourselves to that concept interpreting this chapter. And once you realize that, you realize that the Trinitarian has to say something very strange about the first verse. John there has to be using the word theos in two very different senses, and that seems unnatural. It seems like when he's using a word in rapid succession like that three times, it makes more sense to suppose that he's using it in the same sense. 
And then if you assume this, you cannot get a coherent Trinitarian reading of that passage. Another point he's making is that context is king, and John was not the first one to talk about the Logos of God by any means. And so we have to look at earlier writings to see what could be going on, because it's by looking at earlier writings, which John's audience may well have known, that we'll find out what the background of ideas is here, the background of ideas that would make this chapter intelligible to the original audience. About Philo, he's choosing to understand Philo to be a consistent monotheist. In fact, Philo is incredibly confusing to read, and he did admit that at one point. Briefly, with Philo's Logos, you're not sure if it's supposed to be an additional being to God, or just a power or manifestation of God, or something like that. And sometimes it sounds like each, and that's why his writings are unclear. About earlier precedents in the wisdom literature, what Martineau says is right, but actually there's a whole lot more to be said on that topic. And I think given what we've learned since this was written, really reinforces that it's the wisdom genre where you personify wisdom, that really is the background to this talk of Logos in this chapter. About personification, he made a lot of very subtle and interesting points. One basic point is that personification doesn't work the same way in all languages. And when you understand how Greek deals with personification, you realize that the Logos, yes, is being talked about as if it's a person, as if it's a self here, but it's not quite as strong or vivid as we perceive it to be in an English translation. And remember, he admits that he sees the force of the objection that, hey, how could this not be a person when it's presented so vividly, personally? In fact, it's said to be prostantheon, to be with God or towards God or something like that. I think he shows that this is just not at all a decisive objection because it's part of this earlier literature to talk about God's wisdom and even God's logos as something that's with him and sort of helping him, right? A person alongside him. I also think he's right about verse 12. It talks about those who believed in his name becoming sons of God. That is understandable as being about God's logos in pre-Jesus times. But yes, it does sound like Jesus, and it would seem that the author is anticipating talking about Jesus. I think one thing you have to realize about the prologue is that in early times, it was a sensitive point that Jesus had been rejected by many or most of the Jews and had been crucified by the Romans. On the face of it, it doesn't look like a glorious victory or a vindication by God. One thing the author is doing in this section is he's putting Jesus' ministry in a wider context. Jesus was widely rejected, yes, but that's just what happens when God's word comes to humankind. A lot of us don't get it. A lot of us prefer the darkness. A lot of us resist. That's how it's always been with God's word, and that's how it was when God's word came in Jesus. So it's putting, if you want to put it this way, Jesus' failure into a wider context where it's just seen as kind of more of the same of the history of God's Word. And by the way, one of his quotations from Philo shows that there was pre-Christian Jewish talk about those who trust God or those who receive God's Word as becoming sons of God. Well, I hope you found that interesting and not too difficult I don't think we're done with John 1 yet on the Trinity's podcast. Maybe the end is in sight. We'll see. This week's thinking music has been the track The Candle by Loyalty Freak Music. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org where you can listen to or download the entire track. If you love the Trinities podcast, please share this episode on social media like Twitter or Facebook. And help other people to find the podcast by giving us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. 
You can also support the Trinity's podcast by giving a certain donation per episode. If you're interested in that, please visit patreon.com slash trinities. Finally, let us know what you think. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode, or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. The Trinities Podcast is supported by and made for thinking believers like you. Thanks for your support, prayers, and encouragement. listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.